So it is my honor now to present our last speaker in this session, uh, Dr. Marshall Summer, or Professor Marshall Summer, who is uh, a chief and the chief of the children of the Division of Genetics and Metabolism at the Children National Medical Center, a center of genetics and medical uh, and medicine uh, research. He is a board certified in pediatrics and clinical genetics and biochemical uh, genetics. Dr. Summer has an expert in the translation studies. He has a tremendous work in the urea cycle, which has involved in the development of the treatment protocols. He is also a chief or the president elected, elected president for the Society of Inherited Metabolic Disorders in North America. So welcome with me, Dr. Ramachar Sapa. So having said all that, I'm not going to say a word about biochemical disorders this afternoon. What I've actually been asked to talk about is um, the advent of clinical genetic testing and sort of its uses and non-uses and things you need to know about in the current age. All right, so let's get going here. Um, I come from a field that tends to oversell what we can do. You all remember gene therapy from the 1990s. It was five years away in 1990, and in 2012, it's five years away. Uh, next, we brought you a uh, whole genome and everything else. And this is sort of the impression we give of what you can do with genetic testing these days. This is more the reality of what we can do with genetic testing. It's useful. It'll get you where you need to go. But it's not going to get you there very fast. All right, why discuss this now? Uh, the availability of genetic testing, if you pick up any magazine ad from some company offering you testing for this and that, so it's really expanding at an exponential rate. Things we can test for, things we can do, but so is the price of genetic testing. It's been going up and up, and the amount of money being spent per patient on genetic testing typically exceeds a lot of their other hospital bills coming forward um, with these types of patients. The other thing you need to know is most of these tests are not that highly regulated. They come on the market so fast and they become obsolete so fast that they typically don't have a chance to go through the normal regulatory mechanisms that a test that would exist for several decades will do. It's also somewhat unclear what to do with the information. Um, for specific gene tests, we'll still get multiple changes where we don't necessarily know how to interpret it. Is it actually a mutation that caused disease or is it actually a change that's a variant, things like that. The other thing is there's sort of a so what phenomenon. Sometimes you get information from a genetic test that doesn't actually necessarily change the prognosis of the diagnosis you've already made and it may not necessarily change the clinical outcome. You've just added some information to the pile you have. Now, let me start off by saying I am, I like genetic testing. I'm also, I have a background as a molecular geneticist. I'm not saying don't do it, but I think there's some things you want to think about. Traditionally, it was for rare diseases. Now, currently, the NIH in the U.S. lists 7,317 rare diseases. So, actually, it's supposed to comprise something like 25 to 30 million Americans, or about 10% of the population there. So rare disease kind of takes on a new meaning when you look at it that way. It's becoming mainstream for a lot of conditions. Cancer field uses this extensively for both looking at what chemotherapeutic regimens, which drugs to use, um, prognosis based on cellular types, things like that. I think, frankly, to me, the most promising field in genetic testing right now is an infectious disease. It's allowed us to speed up the diagnostic time for what viruses and bacteria are affecting our patients. Um, you don't have to worry if the patient's already been given antibiotics, things like that. I view this as actually one of the, the really hot topics right now. Drug metabolism is the other one that keeps coming up. Neurology and developmental disabilities, there's obviously a lot of um, buzz right now about genetic testing and autism, things like that. And then forensics. Um, there's obviously any of you who watch any of the crime shows, uh, DNA, complete genome sequencing, can be done in five minutes compared to the entire world's population and answer if the person left their DNA at the scene of the crime or not, which of course doesn't happen that way, but that's sort of the popular uh, view of it. And then we've got a lot of things that are like what I would call risk genetic testing or personalized medicine. That's probably the field you read the most about in magazines these days, where we will sequence your DNA and then we will pull out a crystal ball and tell you your medical risks going forward and what's going to happen to you and how you should be treated. And then there's the last what I call recreational genetics. That's direct to consumer marketing of genetic testing kits where you can find out interesting things about yourself. Some of them 
are geographic, where your, your ancestors may have come from, and some of them are a little more personal, like paternity testing. <clears throat> but I like to think of tests as two types. The first category I would call is reactive. That's where we know something's wrong. You've got a patient who doesn't look right, something's not going on the right way, and you need to find out or you want to find out what it is. Um, why is this useful to you? You might know what else is going to go wrong. It can have some prognostic effects. And it's useful to know who else in the family might have the same thing. So that's kind of your reactive group of tests. And then there's your predictive or proactive, and this is the fastest growing. That's where you want to know if something might go wrong or how someone will respond to an external stimulus. You know, going into cancer chemotherapy, if you have this change or that change, you may or may not respond to the drugs properly. This is still very, very early stages of utility because this is really more of an epidemiology question than it is a straight molecular genetics question. And the data on phenotype and association between phenotype and these genetic changes is a monstrous project that is going to take literally decades to do. Having said that, they'll probably have it finished in five years, but still, I think this is a very long-term project. Uh, it's most advanced in pharmacogenetics. Several reasons for that. One, that's where the money is. Um, but the other is, that's sort of the low-hanging fruit when you can look at pharmacogenetics or pharmacologic effects of gene changes. It doesn't always produce actionable data, but many things we do in healthcare do. We'll find out something, for instance, my doctor will tell me I'm overweight and need to lose some. That doesn't necessarily make it an actionable item to me. Um, but there's lots and lots of work to be done here. So the coming of genetic testing, I sort of look at as the ultimate in job security for myself. Here's a case of economic reality. So we took four random patients from our floor who'd had genetic testing, not under the direction of the genetics division, so I couldn't yell at my own people for this. On those four patients, um, with just non-infectious admission causes, there was $70,000 worth of genetic testing. Uh, in our current insurance program, the hospital only recovered um, about 32,000 of those dollars, and so the hospital actually lost $36,000 on genetic testing for those patients. What we're finding is a somewhat indiscriminate use of testing. Um, I hope there, are there any neurologists in the audience? Okay, good, I'll pick on them. Um, what we found is neurologists seem to be unable constitutionally to go past an open box on a laboratory form without checking it when they're working up a patient. And what we found is lots and lots of DNA testing was ordered without necessarily good rationale. When we actually interviewed these four families, none of them were aware they'd had genetic testing. Um, the, when we actually did a blind review of the utility of the testing in those patients, about 70% of it wasn't actually useful, and none of them had a positive result, and the families hadn't been counseled about the testing they were having. So one of the things we need to do, this is not your typical laboratory test. This isn't like ordering a blood gas or an amino acid profile or a set of electrolytes. This is something that has sort of a permanent part of this patient's record. These are not data points that typically change a lot. So that you have to treat the ordering of these tests a little differently, and you have to make sure the families know what you're getting into. So what are some of the test selection factors you want to use when you're thinking about genetic tests? First off, what's the quality of the information you're going to get? Is it going to be useful to what you want to do? What's the cost of it? And these days, you have to look at that. Those four patients ran up huge bills. I looked at our uh, hospital spends about $1.5 million a month in DNA testing, a lot of which is unrecovered. Then the utility of the information. There's an old adage, don't do a test if you don't know what you're going to do with the answer. Think about what you're going to do with the answer to that type of DNA testing you're going to do. And then the ability to process the information. We have a lot of folks who are very excited about the new large sequence um, technologies, they're very exciting, there's a lot you can do with them, but on a typical you'll get literally thousands of answers to the question that you ask, and you have to know how to filter through those. So testing is kind of a matter of resolution. I like this slide because I like space stuff. And our old friend the karyotype is still around and kicking and actually still quite useful, but it's sort of like looking at a picture of Earth and saying all the continents are there, Nothing shifted around too much. Um, you know, America's still got Florida attached to the end of it, so all's kind of right with the world. This is great for things like Down syndrome, trisomies, major rearrangements in chromosomes. You can usually still get it in about 24 hours. So of the types of DNA testing, 
it's still one of the quickest. And that's mainly because it's a developed field that's very mature. The others are catching up to it. Chromosome microarray is our current workhorse for genetic testing. In this case, the resolution's finer. Um, some of the current arrays will use 180,000 to 320,000. Some of the newer ones will use a million bits of DNA that they will probe your human chromosomes and tell if all the pieces are there and then the right copy number. So you can tell if you have extra copies of small pieces or you can tell if you're missing. It's not at the resolution where you're looking at every base pair, but you're really doing a nice sampling all across. So that's sort of like looking at Spain and making sure all the roads are there in the mountains in the cities, so you've improved your resolution. And then there's sequence analysis. That's where we come down to your street, go into your house, open your refrigerator, and see what's in the refrigerator. And we're doing that for every single house. So you're measuring either all of the exome sequences, or you're actually doing a whole genome sequence looking at all six billion base pairs. This is usually more of a confirmatory test at this point. It's you kind of know what you think is going on. You want to see if you can find the mutation that's actually causing it. Um, whole exome sequencing is probably the most popular one used right now. Typically, we'll give about 5,000 positive results. Whole genome sequencing will give about 10 million positive results. At least that's typically the number of variations you'll find in any one person. This is just simply a slide showing what uh, chromosome microarray analysis looks like. You take normal DNA, you take the DNA from your patient, you label one red, you label one green, you mix them together and you look to see if you find an overrepresentation of red or green at any one of these dots here on one of these chips. And then what you'll find is you'll be going along and suddenly it looks all red, and that means that you're actually missing a piece or have duplicated a piece of DNA right in that region. So it's pretty reliable. It's actually been around now for about 10 or 15 years, and it's, uh, the speed's getting up to the point where it's going to start matching chromos uh, karyotypes soon, and the American College of Medical Genetics is about to recommend this as our primary mainstay for first wave diagnosis, even prenatally. So we'll go through that. Um, oh, what does it cost to make a diagnosis in genetics these days? Well, if you're using a microarray um, and you go into it blind, so you take a patient who's got developmental delay or no real specific findings, you do a chromosome microarray on them, the hit rate's about 8 to 10% for something that you think actually caused a problem. That gives you a cost per diagnosis, at least for the, what we're paying, of about $15,000, which is you know, probably acceptable in that range. Um, if you go through a genetics clinic where they're using criteria for when to do the testing, the hit rate goes up to about 25%. So suddenly your cost per diagnosis has gone down to about $6,000. The cost of a genetics evaluation is about $350. So if you do 10 patients, that's $3,500. So you actually end up coming out ahead if you do a filter step before you do testing. It sounds like I'm doing an advertisement for getting genetic evaluation in clinic, and I sort of am, but there's an economic reason to do it that saves money over the long term. Um, you get a lot of things that are called variants of unknown significance. That's not a French word. That is actually an acronym that we use, and we hate these. And that means we find something, but we don't know what it means. When we first started doing chromosome microarray, about 60 to 70 percent of the variations we found, we didn't know what they meant. Now it's down to about 10 to 15 percent, and it keeps shrinking as we do more and more of these. So that's getting to be less of a problem. But even in this thing, where we're only doing about 120,000, 180,000, sometimes 300,000 tests, um, that's still a significant number of things we don't know necessarily what we're seeing. Now, sequence analysis. If you look at popular media, it would appear that we all stand around looking at shadowy uh, walls that have the DNA sequence rolling across it, and then we're able to interpret that and tell you what the patient has. Uh, it actually doesn't work that way. It ends up being a whole lot of work. There's several types, though. One in which we use with genomic DNA, where we can either look at just the exons, those coding regions for the genes that make the proteins, which means, of course, that you're ignoring the promoter elements, some of the splicing elements, and some of the distant regulatory elements, but it tends to work pretty well. Uh, then you can do whole gene, where you're doing actually the whole thing, all sort of six billion bases. We can also look at RNA. Looking for both presence and sequence is a good test for if a gene system's working or not. And then mitochondrial DNA, our 16,000 evolutionary hangover that uh, occasionally goes wrong and gives us mitochondrial diseases. And you can use both. Um, these can both be used for both reactive and proactive types of testing as well, kind of like we talked about earlier.
Now, this is, uh, I pulled this off of a commercial site where they were advertising the power of their genetic testing. And it has sort of a Promethean or Prometheus type of parents to it where the DNA sort of illuminates all the information you need. And I wish it worked that way. Uh, it doesn't quite, at least in 2012. Um, but a couple of things to think about with genetic testing. There's this concept called Moore's Law that was developed around the advent of microprocessors and computer chips, which that as time went on, the number of processors you could fit on a chip would actually increase in a linear relationship and that actually the price would decrease in a linear relationship as well. And this is actually borne out in several other fields, cell phones being one of them as well too. DNA is deviated from Moore's Law. We actually came along doing fairly well. The first whole genomes cost about $100 million. About 2008, it was about a million dollars and should have continued on. But then in 09, it hit 48,000. And right now, for a laboratory purposes, you can get a whole genome sequence for around $1,000. Now, you gotta be able to do something with that data. That's just running the chip and getting a downstream dump of the data. The real cost in doing uh, genomic sequencing and whole exome sequencing is in information processing. The post-processing on these is huge. If you just store the raw images, it's 20 to 30 terabytes, depending on the system you're using. Once you've polished it into real sequence, then it gets down to about 1.5 gigabytes. So you could actually put your whole genome on a thumb drive, but the processing to get there will take a team of several people, usually a number of weeks to do, and there will still be chunks of DNA that will be missing or duplicated or difficult to read in that section. So right now we've gone from more of a technical issue of the laboratory, which seems to be fairly easy, to an information processing issue where we have to try to make some sense of all this. So functional testing and talking about some of the newborn screening issues that came earlier can be a surrogate for DNA testing. Newborn screening, for instance, is a surrogate for about 160 different genes that affect the biochemistry of newborns. There's been some pushes on whether or not we should be doing DNA testing for newborn screening or we should be doing um, the classic you know, cards with tandem mass spectrometry. And right now the accuracy of the cards is still ahead of the whole uh, genome or at least genetic sequencing in those. So I think for now we don't need to throw out our Guthrie cards just yet, although we can also use them as a source of DNA eventually. Enzyme testing, tissue staining, protein characteristics, the simple Hemoglobin electrophoresis is actually in many ways a DNA test. You're detecting the underlying genetic differences in uh, sickle cell, non-sickle cell, thalassemias, things like this. The advantages to using the surrogate is that one test will, te will detect many mutants. It'll also tell you if it's got a functional effect, whatever your DNA change might have been on that particular system. So there's still some advantages to using surrogates instead of direct DNA. Eventually that will probably flip but that's several years away. Why do a genetic test? So, you know, what's, what's the actual utility? Well, for one thing, you can uh, determine which genes and regions are involved in a disease. That may be useful from a research standpoint, may be useful to understand the disease that's going on or classify it. As we gain more knowledge, it can become prognostically useful. If I do a karyotype and I know a patient has Down syndrome, I know there are certain things about this patient I'll have to deal with. I'll have to look at thyroid. I'll have to look for leukemia. I need to look for heart disease. Those are all things that are going to direct my subsequent treatment of that patient. But one of the things we need to make sure as we develop genetic testing is we keep that in mind why to do it. What are we going to do with the information that we get? So we'll know about different systems to look for. The other thing is you can test parents and siblings to see who else may either have the disease or be a carrier for the genetic uh, mutation that's involved. We can often offer pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in particularly serious diseases. It can also drive treatment choices. Uh, for colon cancer, there's actually a huge driving force on KRAS mutations about which treatment you uh, do and actually has a huge economic impact on the use of uh, colon cancer and colon cancer treatments. Uh, the other place that it comes in very handy is with the uh, Coumadin warfarin drugs. There are certain mutations there that will significantly change your dosing of those drugs. And at the end of the day, sometimes it just gives you an answer. And it tells the family what happened. It doesn't necessarily give you a why it happened to their child, but at least they may know what's going on. And sometimes that ends a search that may have gone on for many, many years. So some testing strategies for newborns. This is for the neonatologists here. I'll just run through this very quickly. 
If you suspect a trisomy 13 or 18, we consider those emergency conditions. The fastest way to answer that question now is a rapid karyotype that you can get back in 24 hours. If you have a dysmorphic newborn, a child that doesn't look right, has one or two dysmorphic features, a chromosome microarray is now the preferred method. It will take longer, but the information content you get will be much higher and more useful. We also recommend such things as 70 hydrocholesterol for Smith Lindley Opitz, plasmalogens or things for Zellweger's. And then the other thing we always recommend is an ultrasound of the brain, heart, and kidney. That actually ends up being probably one of the most useful screens you can do. Those are your three of your more complex organs. If you've got something wrong on the outside, it's quite highly likely you may have something wrong on the inside as well. Patients with cognitive delay who are non-syndromic, we recommend also a chromosome microarray with testing for fragile X. And then there's some new panels coming along for that that um, they're developed from a number of vendors here. And I'd recommend getting a geneticist involved at that point in time. And then syndromic patients with or without cognitive delay is really going to be specific to the exam. You're going to be able to subcategorize those patients quite a bit. Microarrays still used quite commonly, but you may have a desire to go for more specific genetic testing. So the physical exam is still one of your best determinants of what type of test you can see. So we still need to use a brain on these patients. We can't completely automate the process. So our new sequence-based genetic testing, like I said, this is the thing most people are are having the salesmen show up on their doors and try to get them to use. Uh, there's a new test out almost every week. Uh, insurance reimbursement for these, since they're not typically FDA or regulatory approved, can be somewhat difficult. Now, they'll often push back, and even though it may be the standard of care, they'll say it's still technically an experimental test and won't necessarily cover it. I don't know that you have the same problem here, but if you don't, you probably will at some point in time. The test interpretation is the most difficult. Even with single gene genetic sequencing, you, you'll often have multiple variations that you have to interpret of whether or not they're disease causing or not. And sometimes you'll have three or four mutations that could potentially cause the disease in that patient, and you have to try to sort out which one is which. It's useful to have relatives in DNA, but that can often be difficult. It's hard to convince family members to come in and give their own DNA for testing for someone else. It's kind of one of the unique features of DNA testing is that you have to get uninvolved bystanders into the process who may or may not want their DNA being looked at. And then is it a real mutation or an insignificant variant? We kind of talked about that already. So why do you get these mutations? Well, imagine that you had a copying machine that you put six billion pieces of paper in, pressed copy, and expected it to do it right every single time. Just doesn't happen. In your lifetime, you'll have about 10 to the 16th mitoses. Each gene in your body will mutate between 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 10th times. Uh, fortunately, both copies don't typically mutate in the same cell, and you've got some backup systems, or many of these mutations will actually just kill the cell. So mutations happen all the time. When they happen in the germline, then they tend to get passed forward. Polymorphism versus mutant versus variant. What I'll say on this is basically the old definitions where we would view something as a benign change and other things as a mutation, those days are gone. Um, genetic variations can have varying degrees of effect based on the environmental exposures, based on um, epigenetics, based on the, just the other things in the milieu around them genetically. So, We've kind of come to the point where if it doesn't affect your reproductive fitness too much, it's probably not a really bad mutation, but it still may be a variation. And then the next question is, what's a variation? So if we find a genetic change with a distribution of 50% in the population, which one's supposed to be there, which one's not supposed to be there? Or if we find one where the is present in one population but not present in another, which one's the variation, which one's the baseline. So one of the biggest discussions is what constitutes baseline genetics. That's one of the reasons I was glad to see that there's an Arabic genetic program in place so that you can actually determine what the variations are in your population so that you can properly interpret genetic testing if you start to employ it. So the latest thing are sequence panels. There's a panel for almost everything you could want. There's one for cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, seizures, um, neuropsychological issues, just about everything. These are chip-based sequences. They're not whole genome. They're not whole exome. 
they'll typically cover somewhere between 40 and 100 genes, and they're resequencing. So they're fairly accurate. The problem is, is since the genes associated with these diseases change so quickly, these panels become obsolete, usually after several months' time, and then a new one has to be invented. As I said before, I think really the latest thing that I'm so encouraged about, and it's been out for a few years, is infectious disease sequencing. This really does improve turnaround times for patients, and I think it improves targeting of therapy quite a lot too, particularly in patients with meningitis, things like that. Whole exome, this is uh, the one we're seeing coming into the neurology departments and a lot of others. Here's just kind of a, a little case study for you. So Nature Genetics, uh, they published a paper out of Denmark where they took 200 normal adult Danes. I'll have to ask my Norwegian colleague what a normal adult Dane would actually be defined as. Uh, excuse me, um, Amsterdam, sorry, from uh, Holland instead. In those, they found 18,654 genes they sequenced, so they didn't even do all the exons. They found 121,000 nucleotide variations, 53,000 of which the software predicted would change the protein that they were involved in. So the false positive rate here, as you can see, is huge in these things. Um, one of the approaches we're looking at is actually doing a masking thing where we just look at the genes relevant to the question we're asking. That reduces some of that problem, but it's still a fairly huge problem that you need some experience with molecular genetics in. When would I use it? I would use it in a family that you've gone through the regular things and I would use it sort of in a research setting. At this point in time, you're going hunting for something that you haven't already figured out. So you need an extensive family history, you need multiple family members to test, you need to have a hypothesis of what you think is going on because you'll get multiple positive results. So when you're interpreting the genetic variants you see, you need to be able to apply that hypothesis to what you're looking at. So this is one of those ones you might not want to go into the woods by yourself. You probably want to have a few friends along to help you figure out what you're looking at. Whole genome. The picture of the gal with the headache is sort of what this makes me feel like. Um, a hospital near ours at Children's uh, that has a very large delivery service that, where they have over 17,000 deliveries a year collected DNA on 1,000 newborns and then did whole genome sequencing. They spent roughly $30 million on this project. They had no phenotype to match this up the, other than that the patients were premature and they now have 1,000 small bits of data that they can't align and they can't particularly use. Whole genome is not something that we're ready for clinically yet. We do not have the phenotype information well characterized enough to compare to all six billion pieces of data. I think we will be able to. I think this is a really good technology for the future, but right now this is something where we've got a tremendous lot of um, foundation work to do before this is something I would use clinically. It's a good research tool, but that's kind of where it is right now. So the limitations, other things. Variable penetrance. Just because you have a mutation doesn't mean you get to the disease. When the gene that caused um, adult pulmonary hypertension, primary pulmonary hypertension was found, it was the bone morphogenic protein receptor type 2, I believe, and they thought, aha, now we can tell who's got it. When they went back to the families for this autosomal dominant disease, they only found 20% of the people with the mutation actually had the disease. So you can actually have penetrance in which you have a mutation and you may not give a disease, and then you've scared someone pretty badly, um, even though you still may want to screen them. Our software systems for determining if a genetic mutation is a friend or foe are still very crude. They're improving on a daily basis, but they've got a way to go. And remember, a lot of the tests just look for the most common mutations. Depending on the population you're dealing with, the most common mutations in North America may not be the most common mutations where you live. So you need to have panels and things to look at that are specific to the group you work for. And then, of course, there's always swap specimens, but there's like that with any other test. Things to remember. Patients and physicians poorly understand the concept of risk and association. That is why the city of Las Vegas is still an incredibly profitable place for the uh, state of Nevada. Um, people are bad at risk evaluation. We just are. That's, um, we make bad investments. We interpret data incorrectly. And we're even kind of hardwired to work that way. The other thing you want to do is make sure a family having genetic testing has very clear counseling before the test is done on what the study either will or won't do. People have sort of have a magic investment 
in what they think it will do, and then they're often very disappointed when it won't or if the answers are particularly vague. So it's best if that's done beforehand. Most physicians don't do this very well. I'm probably as guilty as anyone else. In the United States, we actually have a new profession. Well, it's not that new, but it's really evolving of genetic counseling, and it's a master's level degree program where these are folks trying to sit down with families and walk them through what this means and what it doesn't mean. And it's an incredibly good investment, and I'd recommend developing a pool of them because you're going to need it. Personalized medicine, this was where we we're going to determine everyone's health risk. Um, eventually we'll have babies like NASCAR and uh, others where you know they can kind of come out however you want to. This is going to be an interesting thing in health, but it's not there yet. There's only about 72 examples of personalized medicine or genetic changes where you'd actually make a significant change in clinical care for that patient. So out of all those variants you're going to detect when you do the sequencing, there aren't that many action items. And the action items typically would only come into play under extreme clinical conditions like cancer chemotherapy, things like that. It's useful, but it's not quite as widespread or not quite as heavy as we'd like it to be. Drug use, that's the biggest development, and a lot of new drugs are coming now with genetic testing as part of the recommendations before you use the drug because the metabolism may be affected by those. 33 currently have those on the drug labeling um, for using those drugs. All right, looks like I'm about out of time, aren't I? And I'm the last talk, though, so, you know, I'm not stepping on anyone's toes. Um, this is the key. If we want genetic testing to be useful, we have to have phenotypes. Electronic medical records, probably the best way. Only 50% of patients in the U.S. have those, and that's pretty much standard across the board. And it's got to be deep phenotype information. It's got to be stuff you can use to do correlations between genetic variations and that. I mean, the, the work we all have to do is we've got to carefully clinically describe our patients, and then if we can start to compare that to the DNA eventually, our next generation of physicians will have something useful to work with here. Economics, um, it's estimated we can save $604 million a year in healthcare on metastatic colorectal cancer just by testing the KRAS gene. So you can get some big economic impacts by using these things. Um, about 17,000 strokes from dose, dosing warfarin better and about a 34% reduction in overall chemotherapy drug dosing by prior genetic testing. So as I said, most of the really actionable items right now are in the chemotherapy field. I kind of like this one. Um, it's, this is what we're doing with the data, all three billion pieces, uh, like a giant puzzle we're trying to put together. This is the direct-to-consumer, and I'm about to wrap up. This is what I refer to as recreational genetics. Uh, it's about like that. It's a roller coaster ride. You can go to any drugstore in the United States and buy a home DNA testing kit where you take a small cheek squab and mail it off. You can mail order them here. Google sells them. Yahoo sells them. National Geographic actually sells them. Um, the information is not particularly useful, um, which they keep it that way because the lawyers won't let them do anything too serious in there. Uh, and it's also difficult to interpret. So we routinely get four or five calls a week from someone who did a home genetic testing kit and has now convinced themselves they're about to die. And typically they're not. Uh, you can also do it for horses and dogs. Um, and you can even tell where it is. This I actually did one on myself to see where uh, my chromosomes had migrated from. I was pleased to see that I did make a swing through the Middle East before my ancestors came up through Asia and eventually branched off into parts Northern European. So it's kind of, it's, that's more for entertainment. That's why we say we call it recreational genetics. And the other thing, of course, is what does the future bring for this? Is it going to bring us better health? Yes. Do we have a lot of work before we get there? Absolutely. And I love this quote from uh, William Osler, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. And I think that certainly applies uh, to this situation. And with that, I will draw this talk to a close. Thank you very much for your attention.